Welcome to State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well, broadcasting on KSQD Santa Cruz on 90.7 FM and live streaming at ksqd.org. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, licensed marriage and family therapist. Today, we're going to be discussing tick-borne illnesses, specifically Lyme disease, and the mental health effects associated with this illness. While ticks are present all year round here in Santa Cruz, and winter is a period of high tick activity, the start of spring marks a time when many of us are spending more time outdoors, hiking in our gardens and yards, and the likelihood of being bit by a tick increases. That is why we're covering this important and timely topic now. Results from our county's 2018-19 Tick-Borne Disease Surveillance Program indicated that approximately 2% of adult western black-legged ticks that were tested are infected with the bacteria that can cause Lyme. In the United States, reported cases of Lyme disease have tripled in the last 20 years. Still, there are preventative measures you can take, and you can learn more about these by going to the resource list that's included with the posting for this show on Lyme disease and mental health. The preventative measures you can take can be found at ksqd.org backslash state hyphen of hyphen mind backslash. With me to discuss how people learn to live with and heal from Lyme disease are Judith Ain, who is here to graciously share her personal story of living with Lyme disease, and family medicine physician assistant and integrative medicine specialist, Dr. Cynthia Quattro, who will help us learn more about this tick-borne illness and offer information about where and how to get accurately diagnosed and where to find help and support. Judith Ain is a native Californian. She was a serious child, dyslexic, and a musical math whiz who felt more comfortable with animals than with people. She almost died of pneumonia after her first quarter of her junior year in college, and through the physical and emotional depletion in the wake of that, she learned how to choose life and choose to get up every day. Subsequently, she's been living as a pilgrim for justice and peace and healing. She was exposed to Lyme disease at some point between 1986 and 1990, during which she was part of two international walks for peace and the environment. Though she was not diagnosed with Lyme until 2002, after years of deteriorating health and an automobile accident in 2000, which potentiated the Lyme disease. She experienced significant improvement in her health during the first 10 years after she began treatment for Lyme in 2005. She had a major setback in her health after receiving a tetanus shot in January of 2016, so that she has subsequently needed to be focused primarily on her basic self-care. Dr. Cynthia Quattro is a family medicine physician assistant who specializes in treating Lyme disease and chronic illnesses using integrative medicine. Dr. Quattro uses a systems-based approach to recommend nutrition, diet, and lifestyle changes, in addition to more conventional medicine diagnostics and treatments. She has had a medical practice in the Santa Cruz community for more than 20 years, where she treats adults and children. Dr. Quattro has treated many patients living with chronic Lyme disease, mental health concerns, and other long-term illnesses using a mind and body approach. She believes that mental wellness is part of a whole body system health plan necessary to achieve optimal health. Cynthia Quattro is also a doctor of acupuncture and specializes in the more gentle style of Japanese acupuncture. This style strongly supports the immune system and connects the mind and body through interrelated pathways. She lectures and teaches seminars for Bay Area acupuncture programs on the treatment of Lyme disease and chronic illnesses using integrative approaches. Dr. Quattro is writing a book on integrative medicine treatment for Lyme disease. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so very good to be us. here. I'm so glad to have you both. Um, so starting out, um, I wanted to start with you, Dr. Quattro. Um, you're here to educate us about what Lyme disease is and to provide some information about diagnosis, treatment, and local resources. Can you start by describing what tick-borne illnesses are and specifically what Lyme disease is? 
Sure. Thanks for having me on the show, yeah. Deborah. I want to give a little bit of historical context. You know, ticks have been around for a very long time. If you even uh, look at the history of the Egyptian tombs, they would find ticks, you know, inside these tombs, and partially because uh, they have a very hard shell that protects them from their predators. So it's not new. Um, but what Lyme disease is, is a mostly considered a bacterial condition. Uh, it's spread by what's called a, the black-legged tick. There are different species, and we have one species here on the West Coast called Pacific Exodes. Um, it's, uh, it, the bacteria itself has a unique shape, or what we call the morphology. It has a corkscrew shape, so therefore it can penetrate deeply into the tissues as, as it can corkscrew deeper. Uh, the other problem with getting bit by one of these ticks uh, is that there are other bacterias, uh, viruses, and parasites that it can transmit. Um, you mean aside from the Lyme disease itself? Aside from the Lyme bacteria. The, the bacteria that we're talking about here uh, is the Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, however, the co-infections that are common are ones called Babesia and Bartonella. Um, without uh, early treatment, uh, these uh, symptoms that can be uh, transmitted by the tick uh, can become chronic, and that's where the complications come in. And for those bitten by a tick, what's the likelihood they'll contract Lyme disease? So according to a vector control specialist in Santa Cruz County, uh, Lyme disease can be found in 2.1 cases per 100,000 people. Uh, that's compared to the U.S., where it's 100 people per 100, 100 cases per 100,000 people. Here, it's common because the climate, it's warm and wet, and ticks like, like that. Um, I've heard once that um, in the Nicene Marks uh, forest, that as many as 30% of the ticks are infected with Lyme bacteria. So there might be concentration areas in our county. Yes. Oh, okay. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I, and why do you think it's important to talk about a medical condition like this on a show where we focus primarily on mental health conditions? Well, I think uh, the problem is that chronic Lyme disease can uh, penetrate through the blood-brain barrier and it can impact uh, the, the brain tissues themselves and create uh, chronic illnesses such as neurological conditions uh, as well as mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think people need to know the progression of the condition. Uh, and, and really the emphasis is it should be treated early. Okay. And it can prevent these chronic diseases. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I think we're going to learn a lot more about what forms the disease takes. Um, but first, we're going to hear from uh, my other guest, Judith, who has um, come in to share with us her story about being infected with Lyme disease, um, how she finally got diagnosed. And how she's learning to live and manage having a condition that's called chronic Lyme disease. Um, can you tell us how you did come to find out that you had Lyme disease and, you know, how you contracted it and how you started to figure out what was going on? Well, um, it's good to be here, Deborah. Um, um, I, it was a, I was, I went through a long period of, of declining health, um, probably, um, in the 90s, I started having gross motor tics, like a, a Tourette-like tic disorder. And, um, so you also mean like involuntary movements? Involuntary movements mm -hmm. and stuff like that. That was that, This was new to me. Um, and, um, and then I also got into um, abuse recovery, which, you know, that was something that started at that time. And, and then... So I, w I was going through that period, and it was kind of bumpy because of those things. And then I had an automobile accident in the year 2000, and then I started having... I had had occasional problems with my legs start starting to give out before that, very occasional. And after that, I started having serious issues walking and a lot of weird neurological things, mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, in your bio, like, you talked about the accident potentiating the Lyme. Could you explain what that means? Well, um, when you have Lyme disease, um, um, you know, the, 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 you're, uh, there's some, hopefully some balance between your immune system attacking the, the, the pathogen and then your um, 
your um, the 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 pathogen kind of trying to grow and take over, winning more. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this little battle going on, and and if you're doing if you're in your in a relatively normal situation, hopefully that that the, the your your immune system is winning. When when you have like an accident or 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 some other big Drama that that happens in your life that can sort of suppress your you know your body's putting energy into something else and so then the the bacteria starts to flare doing, to flare and, okay. and and invade maybe new parts of your brain or whatever yeah or knees or different people it, it basically my understanding is that the bacteria goes to people's weak points you know it can go to people's hearts there's there's Lyme carditis is one of the one of the things mm-hmm. that can happen mm-hmm. that's Fortunately, not one one of the things yeah. that happened to me, yeah. but but um, yeah, it it can it can do all different okay. things. So, how did you start to figure out what was going on? You were well, having these really serious events occur where your legs would give out. That yeah. sounds pretty scary. Yeah, and so I I I had was seeing a chiropractor. I had I had been in chiropractic treatment um, somewhat before my accident, but and and. Um, Anyway, I, I was continuing with this doctor afterwards, and he was sort of more than your more than your typical chiropractor. He did a lot of testing with um, kinesio- kinesiological testing, and as it happens, his wife had Lyme disease, so he was very knowledgeable about Lyme disease. And so, at one point, he did some testing, and he said that's what he thought I had. Did you, and, did it make sense? Like when you got, did you know that you had been bitten by a tick? And did you get like the typical symptoms that they talk about? Like, uh, well, Dr. Quattro, maybe you want to, can I pause you for a moment? Sure. What are those typical symptoms sometimes that they often say to look out for when you've been bitten by a tick? Sure. The acute symptoms are symptoms that might you might feel like you're getting a cold or a flu. It would be fatigue, um, achiness, maybe a dull headache. Um, Sometimes you see a rash, but uh, unfortunately, in conventional medicine, they consider the rash a, a common finding. But in reality, uh, through extensive research, it shows really that only about 30% of the people get this bullseye, this classic bullseye rash. Um, the problem there is even if you do get a rash, it could be small and it could be hidden in areas that you may not notice, such as behind the knees or in the axilla or on your back or somewhere where you don't even notice it. Um, what can happen is some uh, people will feel as though they just are, have this cold symptoms and it may go away, those, those initial symptoms, after about 10 days or so, uh, maybe even shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, however, if it's not treated during that window of time, then it can become chronic. And this is where the problems set in. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to come back to you, Judith, because I was curious. Did you have any of those initial acute symptoms that Dr. Well, Quattro mentioned? I mean, part of it, in my history, you noticed that I had pneumonia. And um, I mean, I've had respiratory kinds of things over the years. So I, I look back and I think when I probably w- w- contracted it, you know, this is in retrospect. Yeah. I mean, I have, I've had a lot of respiratory, you know, the things. So, but, but in, in, in the year 1987, I was a part of a, a, a American Soviet peace walk and we gathered in, in Virginia and then flew to the Soviet Union. And by the time I got to Re- Leningrad, I was sick and I was sick for quite a while while I was there. And, um, and um, I had not only, not only this cold or just, you know, miserable feeling kind of thing that was going on, but um, then at some point I also got an eye infection, which was something more unusual for me. And I understand that that can sometimes be related to Lyme. You know, I had pus coming out of my eye. You know, when by the time I got home back to Washington D.C. Um, anyway, and and it was after that that I started having started having things like the tick, the the motor ticks, mm-hmm. the gross mo- mm-hmm. the, the they were little mo- gross motor ticks at first, and then they became much more more obvious. Mm-hmm. So when this doctor told you that he so thought you and had... I knew I had bitten I knew I had been bitten by a tick, but 
as far as I know, the ticks that I remember being bitten by were not the type that carry Lyme. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and I understand that it's very common for the people to get bitten by like nymphal ticks. That, that are so small they don't even know they were bit. Yeah, well, I know I mean, that I've frequently... taken a few, I live in the woods, and I've taken a few ticks in to have them, t you know, to see if they're the kind, and they are so small. Yeah. I mean, it would be hard to know almost. They're sometimes no bigger than a small sesame seed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th this is uh, the problem. Um, they can be as small as a poppy seed. Poppy seed. Um, and once they bite, they could fall off too. So you may not always see the, the tick embedded for a long period of time before you find it. Yeah. Um, the other problem is the removal of the tick. Um, once it's embedded, uh, oftentimes uh, it's, it's hard to get out and sometimes the head is left in. So the most important thing to do is when you get a tick bite, is to use a tweezers and to pull back on it directly from the head and not to use oil or a match or, or a cotton ball with alcohol, but really just to grab it with the tweezers as best you can um, to remove it and to keep it. Um, to be able to identify it is an important way of knowing that you have the potential to get Lyme disease. Uh, the, the Lyme tick has a, a copper colored shell uh, and uh, this is you know, a key finding for the, the, especially the West Coast tick. Uh, and uh, you can put it in a Ziploc bag uh, with a cotton ball, and uh, a damp cotton ball, and send it off to uh, one of our resources here, which is the BayAreaLime.org uh, website, mm -hmm. and they do free uh, tick testing, and they will also test it for the co-infections as well. Uh, and this will give you an idea if that the tick that you were bitten by was infected or not. And it's important to know if it, uh, what it does look like so you can identify it because perhaps it's not a, a lime carrying tick, such as the dog tick, which has a white color on the back. And there are other ticks too that are not infectious. Mm -hmm. Judith, coming back to you, so you, when you were finally diagnosed by this chiropractor, did it all make sense to you? Did that feel like it put a lot of things into perspective or what was your reaction well, to that? Well, um, I've been, I, I would say that I've generally been a, a complicated pe patient for people who deal with complicated patients. So it's hard to, sometimes it's, it's, it's just been a struggle to figure out what, what is going on. And it was, so it was sort of hopeful. It's sort of like, I, I, I have, you know, if it's this, maybe I, maybe I can do something to treat it. So there was, it was hopeful, but it was also um, frustrating and difficult because he, he knew that I needed antibiotics, but he was a chiropractor. He can't give me antibiotics. He could do certain things to support my, my treatment, but, but, but he really encouraged me to go um, try and get a doctor who knew how to treat Lyme. Mm -hmm. And the one that he knew, the one that his wife went to, was in Reno. And I went to see him one time, and he confirmed the diagnosis doing a, doing a, um, a just a clinical examination in history. And, um, and, and then, and then I came back and tried to get another doctor to, to treat me because I didn't have a a, a, a Lyme doctor at that point. Okay. You're tuned to listener-supported 90.7 FM KSQD Santa Cruz, K-Squid, Many Voices, One Station. And this is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with guests Judith Ain and family medicine physician assistant and integrative medicine specialist, Dr. Cynthia Quattro, and we're discussing Lyme disease and the mental health symptoms associated with this illness. And now a word from our underwriter. Family Service Agency provides counseling and support for people of all ages facing life crises and challenges. You can reach them at 423-9444 to see if they can help you. Thank you, Family Service Agency of the Central Coast, for supporting KSQD 90.7 FM. Back to our interview. So um, I wanted to ask you, you talked about getting diagnosed. 
And you, you mentioned um, that antibiotics might be something that you were needing at that point. What were the treatments that you pursued for well, once it was diagnosed. Well, the first thing that happened is the, the doctor in Reno wanted me to do to treat also for babesiosis, which is one of the other um, tick-borne infections. But, but, um, but, I don't know that I had this one test done, which was really a more of a study test than a clinical test that I was able to use to convince the, the local doctor to give me IV rocephin, which is a, a one of the main treatments that they use for for the, the Lyme disease. Is that an antibiotic it's treatment? It's an antibiotic, okay. yeah, IV. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for, I don't know, eight, I forget, maybe a, two or three months, I forget exactly, mm -hmm. where you have to get a pick line that's in, I, it was inserted around my the elbow and up, in, and up into the heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to, to give me the antibiotics. So let me ask Dr. Quattro, is that typical to have, and so if you had a PICC line, it means that it was a long course of antibiotics. Yeah. Is that a typical treatment, or can you speak about that a little bit? Uh, sure. I think with speaking about treatment is important. Um, I think uh, in acute disease, uh, is the most important time to actually get treated. Um, and soon after you have uh, a tick bite, um, there, there's some controversy about how to be treated when you first get bitten by a tick. But uh, the Lyme Literate Doctors, um, which uh, is also one of our resources, the ilads.org website. Can you talk um, about that before you go on? What sure. is a Lyme Literate Doctor? Uh, so a Lyme Literate Doctor is one who has been trained by uh, doctors who have the experience of treating chronic Lyme. So they have programs, uh, training programs for providers to, to learn, you know, what's the best way to treat. Um, there are some uh, providers that have not necessarily gone through the full program, but they have been trained you know, through experience and through conferences, um, various uh, other ways to, to be informed. But the website will list those that are uh, certified, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. I myself studied with Dr. Stricker, the first president of ILADS, um, before they started having the training programs. So um, I've got my you know, experience starting from there. Um, so there... Their main point, I think, in terms of an initial, after an initial tick bite, is to get treated right away. And this would be some form of antibiotics. Uh, and the course of the treatment should be longer than is typically prescribed. For instance, I've known people to go to urgent care and they'll get one dose of an antibiotic and it's considered to be the treatment for a tick bite, which uh, is found not to be adequate. Um, the course typically should be at least 10 days, if not up to three weeks of an antibiotic after having a tick bite. Some people choose to use herbal antibiotics instead of a prescription form of antibiotics. This gives you some time before uh, you can get a test done, for example. However, when you have uh, a test done, it has to be some time, at least four weeks, if not longer, after you've had the tick bite for the test to be positive. So there's this lag time, which is important to be treated, you know, during that time. When you say the threat has to be positive, meaning to show again that you still have Lyme? Uh, for, Lyme the, for, for an initial blood test uh -huh. after you have a tick bite, yeah. but the, it should be uh, after the tick bite, after three or four weeks of having been bit. The, the, so it's not, it's not positive. The tick, the, uh, the tick does not necessarily show antibodies in the immune system. For some time. It takes for time. For some time, yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. Because yeah. mm -hmm. the, the test for Lyme tests for the antibodies to Lyme. So your body has to have, have time to, to make the antibodies right. before it will test In a positive. high enough concentration for them yeah. to show up in a exactly. test. It doesn't look for the bacteria proper. It looks for the antibodies. Got it. So that crucial period of time between the tick bite uh, and when a test would actually show positive is important for treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a struggle for people because uh, most conventional doctors don't treat um, adequately, and some won't treat at all unless you have a rash. And if the rash only shows up in about 30% of the people, that's a lot of people that's missed uh, that to, to get treatment. So all the more reason to try to find somebody that is Lyme literate, right, who might mm -hmm. see the bigger picture in this way. And I just, I want to make a clarification because I know when we were speaking in preparation for you to come on the show, you really made this distinction between acute Lyme disease and chronic. 
And so right now what you're talking about is the acute phase, right? Yes, this is the acute phase. Yeah. You know, soon, you know, after the tick bite. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What happens is that if it's not treated, then it can progress and become chronic Lyme disease. And of course, this depends on many things within that person's individual um, system. You know, for instance, their the status of their immune system, or even their genetics play a part. Uh, lifestyle and their diet, many things play a part in how some one person ends up with chronic disease and someone else may not. Yeah. So you know, so in terms of talking about the mental health symptoms that are part mm -hmm. of it, to what extent are those part of the acute and or chronic phase? Mm -hmm. So typically the mental health symptoms occur once they're, they are in the chronic phase of Lyme disease. Um, there was a study done at uh, Columbia University, Dr. Fallon specializes in psychiatry, and he found that one-third of the psychiatric patients there showed they'd had a past infection with Lyme bacteria. Um, and overall, they say about 20% of the Lyme patients, the chronic Lyme patients, show either mental illness or a nervous system disorder. So those are the kinds of symptoms that Judith was describing about those sort yeah, of neurological. It, it can start, uh, the mental health symptoms can start as just a, a more persistent fatigue, or they may be more depressed or, or just less happy than they used to be or less enthusiastic than they mm -hmm. used to be. It'll be subtle. It'll be a gradual onset. Um, there may be more irritability or agitation. Um, even attention deficit has been associated with Lyme disease, uh, even psychosis. Um, there, in the advanced stages of chronic Lyme disease, there can be cognitive decline and then the neurological symptoms uh, that Judith was explaining. But I'll tell you one symptom that I've seen commonly run through patients with Lyme, chronic Lyme disease uh, is a sleep pattern disturbance uh, and insomnia. And this has been shown to be a pattern uh, with, with many chronic diseases, but especially with Lyme. And with then, of course, if you have sleep deprivation or lack of good quality sleep, then this further suppresses the immune system and increases the chance for further uh, conditions or, or diseases. Um, the, the Would you say that's a tactic of the disease in a way to um, weaken the system so it can flourish? Or Sure. I think it's a, a competitive bacteria. Mm -hmm. it, it will suppress the immune system over time. Mm -hmm. Can you describe, because that it sounds like that might be one of the first symptoms besides knowing someone got bit by a tick is starting to have sleep problems. How does that show up? Can you talk a little bit about what that look, typically looks like? Yeah, well, it can start off just by ha being more irritable and having difficulty falling asleep at night. Um, and the other patterns would be for instance, someone may be so fatigued they will fall asleep, but then they'll wake up during the night frequently and, and perhaps not be able to go back to sleep. And they'll wake up unrefreshed in the morning, you know, drag through the day, uh, and uh, it just sort of further perpetuates, you know, this chronic fatigue mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, the mechanism there is interesting because uh, if without... Um, uh, good sleep, essentially the, it creates more inflammation in the body, and this is how it perpetuates um, the further worsening of the chronic Lyme bacteria by creating inflammation. Uh, they've done studies where they look at inflammatory markers um, in the bloodstream and found them higher. These are these interleukins you know, that they, they can measure. Um, so there's a clear association between um, sleep deprivation and chronic inflammation which only further exacerbates chronic Lyme disease. Well, that's tricky because inflammation is also seen as connected to a lot of mental health conditions, right? That, um, and sometimes by reducing that, people's um, other, other symptoms like depression, anxiety might improve. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. So um, do you find, Dr. Quattro, that uh, people use a range of treatments that there's not like one thing that you do for to treat Lyme disease that it there is a mixed array of treatments for Lyme disease um, but there it, it, the the core treatment is using some kind of antibiotic if it's not a prescription and herbal antibiotic but then in addition uh, because of I practice integrative medicine I'm always looking to help enhance the body's immune system too or or resupply deficient nutrients or review diet and see if you know, the, the, the diet is not working for them or creating you know, more inflammation. So the, the or not supporting the immune system very not well. not supporting yeah. the immune yeah. system mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and perhaps you know, encouraging more inflammation. So 
These are just some of the treatments along with, uh, I always recommend some form of body work treatment. If it's not acupuncture, some type of uh, massage or body work or osteopathic or chiropractic, something because um, the Lyme disease or any chronic di disease gets tangled up in the body tissues as well. Um, and that needs to be treated as well. So I use a, a very gentle style of uh, Japanese acupuncture. And this helps to support the immune system and helps just move, move the energy around. Plus, it's uh, very relaxing and puts the body into a healing state of mind by shifting the brain waves into an alpha state. Which, you know, that's true in mental health, too, yeah. that mm -hmm. we almost always yeah. recommend people, you know, find some form of exercise or relaxation, whether that be meditation yeah. or yoga or something to um, improve their overall, reduce their stress and improve their overall health. So, yeah, those things, you know, that mind-body connection, it crosses over, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're tuned to listener-supported 90.7 FM, KSQD, K-Squid, and this is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. We're also live streaming on the web at ksqd.org. Now you can tune in to K-Squid anytime through your home smart speaker by saying play KSQD on TuneIn. You can also now listen, download, or subscribe to State of Mind shows on Apple Podcasts and Google Play Music. In case you're just joining us, I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with two guests, Judith Ain and family medicine physician assistant and integrative medicine specialist, Dr. Cynthia Quattro, and we're discussing Lyme disease and the mental health symptoms associated with this illness, as well as how and where to get tested and where to find treatment and support. Back to our interview. Um, so, Dr. Quattro, earlier in the interview, we were talking about the difference between acute and chronic Lyme disease, and we've talked some about the treatments for acute, you know, when you first get bitten by a tick and in that immediate aftermath, but I'm wondering if there's more you want to say about the treatments when somebody has what you call chronic or long-term Lyme disease conditions. I think a lot of uh, patients are confused if they have Lyme disease or not, so the, the first thing uh, for someone... Uh, that's listening that's not sure if they have Lyme is is that there is a questionnaire that you can fill out uh, that's uh, that is online it's one of our uh, resources uh, that can be accessed and it's called the MSIDS which stands for the um, multiple system, system. Uh, multiple Systemic Infectious Diseases Syndrome Questionnaire. And this questionnaire was designed by Dr. Richard Horowitz, who is a Lyme specialist uh, and practices in, in New York, in upstate New York, where he, he has seen so many Lyme disease cases, and has written a very good book called uh, Why Can't I Get Better? And uh, it's very thorough. And he's designed this questionnaire that helps you uh, check off symptoms that you have and then score it to determine if perhaps you really do have chronic Lyme. I think maybe that's the first place for people to start if they're not sure if they have chronic Lyme and haven't talked to anyone about it so far. Um, because uh, Lyme treatment, chronic Lyme treatment, is, is complex, meaning that uh, sometimes the antibiotics are used uh, in, in, in pulse-like patterns in other words, they may take antibiotics for a period of time, take a break while the bacteria goes into a different phase, um, and then maybe restart the antibiotics. And in the meantime, uh, use treatments for immune support, for anti-inflammation, and also to treat any underlying conditions that may be prevalent. As I'd mentioned earlier, perhaps you know a digestive disorder or hormone disorder, treating other things. So it's a integrative medicine approach to, to treating uh, a chronic Lyme successfully. Um, it's, it, from what I have found, uh, not only antibiotics are necessary or, uh, for to treat chronic Lyme, it really needs to be a broad spectrum approach to treat the whole body. And some, from some of the people that I've talked to um, that have chronic Lyme, there's also a whole aspect of how do I learn to live with this? And, yeah. 
Judith, I know you have learned a lot of things over the many years that you've been experiencing yes. this. And do you want to talk a little bit about what it is, you know, what you have done to learn to live with Lyme disease? Well, um, one of the things I, I mean, the, the Qigong has been really wonderful, but other kinds of meditative practices have also been very helpful. Like I deal with a, a, a fair amount of pain related to the Lyme disease. And one of the things that I found that was very helpful is there's, um, I, I as a recording, it's a mindfulness meditation for pain relief, um, but it's it's basically using MBSR, the mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques for dealing with pain. And um, and so, I mean, part part of it, one of the things I that I that's sort of basic about it is sort of like, how can I be without the be, be with the pain without um, making it worse, sort of be present to it, just let it be and, and, and not sort of react against it, which is, I think what part of, I think one of the things that, that's a problem with pain is sometimes is we feel it and we kind of brace up against it. And, and that, that's not, not necessarily helpful. Physically, that's true, but also and, mentally, we have all these ideas like, "Well, this shouldn't be happening," and why, you know, why is this happening yeah. now? And and that tends to exacerbate yeah. people's suffering yeah. too. So, it, I mean, in 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 the sort of Buddhist way of thinking about things, is sort of like is like you, you have something like a pain, and then you shoot yourself with another arrow. You know, it's like pain's like one arrow, and then you kind of react against it with whatever, and and sort of like, okay, let's just deal with one arrow at a time mm -hmm. instead of and and so being with it and allowing yourself to breathe into it and notice it and and sometimes breathing into it and noticing it and noticing it gosh there's a little anger there or there's a little sadness there or there's you know there's a little scared that there there's there's different things that i notice that can be in the pain in different parts of my body and just be that be there notice it um so that's very helpful one of the other things i mean i tend to be fairly isolated to be um partly i i, I my personality is sort of like that is ha happy enough with that but also because it's hard to get out it's just hard to you know deal with all i have to do for my recovery and then to do something else too so that is it's sort of two things but one of the things that i i really have found helpful is there's a, a a program called good medicine how to turn pain into compassion with tonglin meditation by pima children um and basically uh, i mean a, a basic aspect of it and, and the, the, i have a link to um to a couple of YouTube videos of her giving this pre presentation. And, um, I mean, basically it's sort of like, one of the things that I, there's, there's more to it than this, but, 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 but noticing that I have this pain or anger or whatever it is, just whatever the, the disagreeable thing that is that you're noticing at the moment. And to, to notice that there's a whole lot of other people. I, there's a whole bunch of other people that have this exact same pain just right now. And, 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 and you know, I'm not alone in it. I'm not alone in it. And I can, I can make a decision to, I'm going to be with this in a way, and hopefully try and be with this in a way that helps to heal us all. Um, and to just to choose that kind of a, you know, to choose. I mean, part of it is, is is choose, I'm going to be willing to be happy with where I am. Because this is what's so this happening. This is what's happening right mm -hmm. now. To try and to one way and another choose it. Mm -hmm. You know, doesn't mean I don't get annoyed, but. <laughs> But, 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 but just again and again, try and make it to, to choose to be where I am and to notice and appreciate the, the, uh, the good things in my life. Um, and one of the things that I use in conjunction with some of these meditations that I was talking about is heart math. Um, 
there's a there you can there's heartmath.org and heartmath.com that they have they talk about some basic practice practices um the um, quick coherence technique it, it looks at, at at ways of improving your cardiac coherence and when you're when your cardiac coherence is is um, in a good high 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 or you know good good level, it's a biofeedback it, kind of program where you can actually see how you're physiologically responding to changing. How your heart is. Yeah, 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 your internal. I, I think they don't call it biofeedback, but yeah, that's in the, in, the, in, the in a layman's terms, yeah. that that's kind of what right. it is. Yeah, and base, basically, if if you get the technology, I've used the technology over the years. And, and I find it very helpful because sometimes I might feel like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a pretty good space. And then I notice my coherence is not that great. Right. So and it helps. so it helps you to really know when, you, when, you're, re when you're really coherent. Mm -hmm. And I, I use that. That's one of the things I also use with it, that, that can be helpful in, in pain management. Mm -hmm. So I'm just um, going to interpret that for our listeners. It's a tool... I think, to learn emotional regulation. And it gives you feedback on a uh -huh. screen, right? So that well, you... Well, on a screen, if, or just with a sound. With a sound, a sound, right. De depending on which device you use. Okay. That helps you see when you're actually achieving that state so that you can practice it. You can practice yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, 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 that's been a really wonderful thing. And I guess one of the other things that I've found over the years is... Um, you know, I mean, partly the Tonglin is a way of sort of being present with the world. But to try and figure out a way of how can I give, you know, what can I still do? What can I, how can I still be a, a productive person or, or somebody who, who does something, gives something to others, you know? And, and I, I guess sometimes my singing, I, I, I write little songs and, and I, I, you know, I share that in, places where I can and mm -hmm. and in fact you shared one with us yeah, today. yeah yeah and and then another thing is I make I make little origami birds that I just give away I make them to give them away and it's just a way of sort of reaching out mm -hmm. and you know when I, I remember I, there was a time when I felt like my life was like a post in a this little postage stamp size you know I could barely get out of the house and and there was this conference that I heard about, I forget what it was, that I would have liked to have gone to, but I couldn't. So I made, I don't know how many cranes I made and sent them to the people to, so I could be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know it's a bit, it was a big task for you to get here today for the interview early in the morning like this. So I just want to say thank you so oh. much for coming and sharing your story because that is a really big way of giving. I mean, this will be a podcast available uh -huh. for people to access and use as a um, as a resource. So uh -huh. really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm yeah, really and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I want to remind our listeners too. Judith spoke about a number of different um, terrific resources, and those will all be listed on the podcast posting oh. on the KSQD website. And it may I just want give me one more? Is there's a group called Capacitar? that they do wonderful work with people who've been through all kinds of trauma all over the world but they have a little um a little uh, emergency response um sort of booklet that that gives some basic um some different things like emotional freedom technique basic uh, and 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 finger holds for to to manage certain emotions by just holding different fingers which fingers work for which but but it's it's a, just a nice little resource, and there's some other things in there, um, some diff like acu acupuncture points that you can press for one one thing and another mm -hmm. that you can self administer. So. Th th mm -hmm. That you can self administer or do with a partner. Mm -hmm. You're tuned to listener supported ninety point seven FM KSQD K Squid Community Radio for the Monterey Bay, and this is State of Mind being human and living well. We're also live streaming on the web at ksqd.org. Now you can catch any of your favorite programs on KSquid through your home smart speaker 
just by saying, play KSQD on TuneIn. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with two guests, Judith Ain and family medicine physician assistant and integrative medicine specialist, Dr. Cynthia Quattro. And we're discussing Lyme disease, the mental health symptoms associated with this illness, as well as how and where to get tested, how to get treatment, and where to find help and support. And now a word from our underwriter. KSQD thanks Santa Cruz County Mosquito and Vector Control for supporting State of Mind. Santa Cruz County Mosquito and Vector Control provides free tick identification, information on tick removal, and related diseases Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Check availability at 831-454-2590 or pesthelp at agdept.com. Thank you, Santa Cruz County Mosquito and Vector Control, for supporting community radio, K-Squid 90.7 FM. Back to our interview. I, I do know that Lyme is one of those heated topics that frequently there's a lot of um, misinformation about. So I'm, I'm interested to know if there are any specific myths about Lyme disease, Dr. Quattro, that you would like to um, clarify or do some myth busting about sure. today. Yeah, there, there are quite a few, and, and I'll just narrow it down to three. Um, I think the first one uh, for our, our local um, people in this, in this state is uh, there's a myth that we don't have chronic Lyme disease in California. Um, and I think that that um, has been proven uh, by some studies showing that uh, 56 out of the 58 counties in California have had documented cases of uh, Lyme disease. Uh, and there's been Lyme disease reported in, chronic Lyme disease reported in every state uh, in, in the U.S. as well. So I, I think um, it, it is definitely here and the message is uh, to use protective uh, clothing when you're out and check your pets. Um, the next one is that uh, people say, well, there isn't chronic Lyme um, at, at all, that it's an acute disease. The Unfortunately, the Infectious Disease Society feel that there is only acute Lyme, uh, therefore they don't typically have a protocol for chronic Lyme. But um, in fact, um, it's been shown uh, by uh, some of these um, the, the con con continuous testing that Lyme persists and can become chronic, uh, and also using the questionnaire to look at the constellation of symptoms that can show that you have chronic Lyme. Um, makes it clear that there that it does exist, and I think the third one is that there's another myth that says once you have Lyme you'll never be well again, and I have seen enough people and have treated enough to know that it, it can be treated, uh, and it can be treated successfully. Uh, better the sooner sooner it's treated the, the better the outcome. However, I think if with a, a whole body system or an integrative medicine approach. I, I think that chronic Lyme can be treated successfully. It doesn't necessarily mean that you get rid of Lyme 100%, but it means that it is under control to the point where your body is well enough to feel well, and you can live a so-called, your, your normal life, the, the way that you'd like to live your life, and as, as far as um, especially recovering from a disability. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, is, is the treatment needs to be focused on uh, repairing the damage that's been done, and retraining the immune system. Uh, and this can be done with uh, nutritional support, uh, herbal support, uh, acupuncture, some of the other things that we've already mentioned. Um, and I, it, it, it may help to think of someone who may live with uh, herpes or hepatitis or even HIV or diabetes. I mean, these are people that have diseases, but they're well-managed and can live a so-called normal life. And I think that we can put Lyme, chronic Lyme into that category. Uh, so, it, uh, I think we, in terms of mental health, um, there, it is important to have support in mental health and also to find ways to work or stay on the positive side um, and have support around you. There's a book that I like that's called uh, Hardwiring for Happiness. It's a, a Rick mm -hmm. Hansen book. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a great book because it uh, helps you enhance your feelings and create enthusiasm about your life regardless of what life you have. Thank you. Yeah. I just think it's so important that we talk about this subject, um, even though this is a show about mental health, because very often in my own practice and also in my personal life, I've encountered a number of situations where people are having 
um, pretty severe mental health um, symptoms and while and ultimately develop other kinds of symptoms that lead to the diagnosis of Lyme disease. That doesn't always mean that the mental health systems just evaporate once that's treated, but certainly they seem to be somehow co-occurring or interrelated in some kind of way. So I personally felt it was, I've had this show on my mind since, um, since I first envisioned the show. So I'm so appreciative that I found both of you with your vast experience and expertise to come in and and both from the lived experience and also in working and treating with Lyme to come in and help me and others learn more about this, especially my hope is that other mental health professionals will learn more about this so that if they see some things, they maybe can recommend to their clients that they get uh, evaluated or tested. Yes, I think it's an important topic, and I have also seen patients that um, are on multiple psychiatric medications that I have found to have Lyme disease. I think it is a, a problem that um, mental health providers often don't understand the implications of the disease on mental health, uh, and when the symptoms are not improving, that they prescribe another psychiatric medication, and they end up on a, a cocktail of medications that perhaps could be treated uh, better by treating the body and, and the underlying condition. Um, when you start to treat the chronic Lyme, have you seen that sometimes people are able to um, reduce or eliminate some of those other medications for mental health conditions? I typically leave the prescribing of the mental health prescriptions to their provider that is pre prescribing right. those. But I have seen improvement where uh, adjustments have been made in the medications or even sometimes you know, a medication being removed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I think mm -hmm. that's um, very, very possible. And there's also a very good brochure that uh, focuses on mental health and Lyme that's available for mental health providers. Um, and we'll, we'll provide you the website for that or a copy of it. Um, on the too. website too? Yes. Okay, so uh, with our resource list, we'll make sure to post that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we're just wrapping up here, and I, yeah, I always like to give people a chance in case there was, you know, something that you were thinking about or you didn't get a chance to say, or even maybe one last point that you want to be sure to leave listeners with. Um, Judith, any thoughts on that? Um, well, it, just um, if you've ever had a tick bite um, or if you've ever been in, in places where there are ticks, um, so just to remember that, and if, if you start having, if something starts happening, don't forget to tell your doctor about it, because doctors will, doctors will not get it on their radar screen unless you tell them, most doctors. Some right. doctors, you know, you're lucky if you have somebody that understands it well enough that they'll say, they'll ask you, actually, have you had this kind of experience, mm -hmm. you know, and been in these kind of places? Okay. But... What about you, Dr. Quattro? Is there any point you didn't make? Or? I, I think my, my point in, in general would be to stay in touch with your health and know what the state of your health actually is. Uh, keep, keep notes about your, your body, how it's doing. So if something is off, that you'll actually recognize that there's something not quite right. And um, those that... Um, uh, regulate themselves on caffeine and alcohol day to day are not necessarily as in touch with their bodies, for example. Um, so um, this way, if you, you do have changes that you, you will know, and once you, you uh, and then which could prompt you to see someone to help you improve from an integrative medicine perspective so that you can heal all parts of your body. I think that's, that's really the message. So I just want to say thank you to both my guests today, Judith and Dr. Quattro, for coming in and talking about this very important subject. Thank you for having us. I think it's such an important topic to discuss. Thank you. I know, I know when I first was told that I had Lyme, I felt very alone. And so I, I, I would have been happy to hear a show like this. Do you camp? Do you hike? Are these things that you like? When you're done, check for ticks, lest they make you very sick. Lyme disease, babesiosis, Bartonella, anaplasmosis, 
All these things are born by ticks. All these things can make you sick. I love it. I think I've heard that before. We're excited to tell you about this new segment that we're now including in our shows. In Your Voice gives you a chance to share a piece of your story in your own voice. You can comment on a previous show, ask a question for an upcoming show, or share a resource. This is how it works. You just give us a call at 831-824-4324 and leave a one to three minute message with your name and your comments or questions. Your voice may just become part of one of our future shows. Some of the upcoming topics that you could comment on are teens and anxiety, parenting teens with anxiety, and forgiveness. And now we've heard from one listener who had some resources to share for this show. Hi, my name is Cynthia Baker, and I'm a life coach and therapist who's been living with chronic Lyme for 20 years. And there are some great websites that I would recommend for anyone with Lyme or anyone who thinks they may have Lyme where you can get more information, resources for accessing treatment, and referrals to Lyme literate doctors. And they are LymeDisease.org, LymeDiseaseAssociation.org, GlobalLymeAlliance.org, and the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. Their website is ILADS.org. And I also highly recommend ChronicLymeDiseaseSummit.com. I hope that's helpful and wish everyone wonderful health and vitality. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I want to say thank you again to my guests today, Judith Ain and Dr. Cynthia Quattro, and thanks to you for joining us here on State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. To hear more conversations about mental health and wellness here on California's Central Coast, join me on the first Sunday of every month from 6 to 7 p.m. right here at K-Squid, 90.7 FM. You can also find all the podcast episodes of this show on ksqd.org by typing State of Mind in the search bar. Special thanks to our audio editor, Jeannie Baldzikowski, and to Jennifer Young, who assists with research and outreach. And finally, thanks to acoustic guitarist Adrian Legg for composing, performing, and donating the use of our theme music. This is listener-supported community radio, so that means we want and we need to hear from you. Let us know what you think about this or any of the shows you're hearing here on KSQD. Just send us an email at onair, that's O-N-A-I-R, at ksqd.org, or call 831-900-5773. This is KSQD Santa Cruz. Just remember, 90.7 FM K-Squid, your ink spot on the dial. Stay with us.